Hello, game day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode, the inaugural of the Hello Game Day podcast. My name is Moose. I'm the Ponch. And we are joined today by EJ from Room 10 Company. He's up in this bitch. Which we love. We love EJ and we uh, rate your work rate. So. But do we like his parking? <laughs> <laughs> so to kick things off, he's actually done a rogue park uh, the other day at front of the studio. We'll get it edited in. We've had to uh, order a taxi from the curb. Uh, from the car to the curb, <laughs> it was that far apart. So EJ's up in this bitch, which he's we a- love. He's 18 though. He's 18 though. So he's learning how to parallel park. But we, we <laughs> 18, 19, same shit. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. No, seriously now, to, uh, we've got the first episode of the Hell Game Day podcast. We're up and about. It's massive. Yep. We've been working for a month uh, and here we are. So this is the run sheet. We've got a bit of story time with Ponchi. We have got, we're going to be talking about how the players have been going during lockdown. We're going to be talking about the draft age. We're going to be talking about when footy is going to return. And we've got our best on segment. We will get to that and Ponchi will give you the lowdown. So first of all, story time, kick us off. A little bit of story time with the Ponch. <laughs> all right. So um, basically about a couple of weeks ago, I had to go get my skin checked and I've gone down to the skin clinic and I've kind of just... We all know you're a very pasty man. I am a white I mean, man. If, if, if it's 11 degrees, you have to slip, slop, slap. 11 degrees and overcast, <laughs> I will get burnt. So I've gone down to the skin clinic uh, reasonably early morning, not thinking about too much. I get in there, speak to the doctor, and basically he tells me to get dressed down to my undies. And in my head, I thought, you know, I'm getting checked all over my skin. I'm, I'm going to get checked, uh, dressed down to the nudge. going to be completely in the nude. <laughs> So, as I'm getting un- undressed, I realise that I'm standing there in my last chance underpants. <laughs> and these are the, this is what I call the last chance underpants, are the ones that are sitting in your drawer and the last ones are there and you know you need to do your washing. So, these are not great at all. They're your, your worst pair that you've got. So, I lay down on the table and I'm a fully grown 25-year-old man. You are. Laying there in Toy Story underpants. Physically fully grown, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the most embarrassing thing. The doctor comes around and he, he looks at me and I'm just laying there, look, sitting in my, or laying in my Toy Story undies. So he's checking me all over my body. And as embarrassing as that was, things were about to get worse because I realized I had to roll over. And I warned him, pre-warned the doctor that there was a bit of a hole. <laughs> there was a bit of a situation in my underpants. Uh, and so as I roll over, I just hear this <gasps> shocked <laughs> gasp come from the doctor. My undies are basically chapless at the back. It's the whole two peaches, steak and two veg, <laughs> just the whole setup. So I'm laying there and it's yeah, one of the most embarrassing you things. You've got a crater the size of the Grand Canyon there. So for people who are watching this today, <laughs> and we will chuck this photo up on Instagram, this is what he was looking down the barrel of. So, there's a, if you want to explain it, Mercy, real quick. You could honestly get both could, mine and your head. I could fit hole. my head through that. It looks like you have gone and gotten the Indian special, the beef vindaloo, extra hot, and you've been breathing fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've blown the casket on it. And uh, <laughs> after the show, they will be uh, getting exterminated for good. So, that's massive. All a right. bit of story time to start us off. Moving on now. And before we move on, I'm going to hit you up with the first, the first yellow flag. Yellow flag. No. What we do is we review the play. I go back in time and I'm reviewing something that you have no idea. No. So I've <laughs> I've been talking to some people, getting some stories to build this part up. So we're taking ourselves back 10 years to the... And hold on, hold on. How old am I? 14. 15. Oh the 14, 15 year old days. Jake edition. Uh, and the kind of bloke you were back in the day, would you call yourself a bit of a rat, rat bag? Bit of a rebel. Yep, bit of a rebel. Without a cause. <laughs> so... We're going on his rebellious stage. Now, you're a model citizen now, yep. so I'll give you that. Yep. But back then, you were a bit of a rat bag. And I want to go on your employment at Coles. No! <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm in the word. Now, can you enlighten me on two things? And we'll keep this quick. <laughs> Is it true that when you were working in the fresh food section, you... <laughs> You used to throw ice... Seafood. 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 I was a fishmonger. <laughs> you 
you used to throw ice at people who were in colds and then duck behind the counter and hide. <laughs> All right, let me give you this story. So I was 14, my first job working at Coles. My older brother worked there and he has an amazing work ethic, my old brother. Yes. Amazing worker. And then he gets me the job and then they're thinking, Natalia, shout out Natalia, the boss. She <laughs> thinks that, okay, boom, we're going to get another really hardworking teenager, pay him $7.29 an hour. <laughs> which was, I wasn't even worth my $7.29. <laughs> and they thought they were going to get another model worker. Which was just not, not the case. <laughs> <laughs> not only would I throw ice at the customers and hide behind, I would also um, spray them with the hose and then hide behind. I got so bored that this is the things I'd, I'd be doing. I'd be hide, hiding behind the desk, throwing ice at them, spraying them. And then the worst thing of all, which is the thing that got me the sack. <laughs> I think I know what this one is. Was that I used to eat so many prawns <laughs> and Thousand Island sauce that... They actually checked the inventory and there was a gigantic amount of, of prawns missing. I've been told that the amount you're eating, they weren't even making profit on the prawns. <laughs> <laughs> they were going into a deficit. <laughs> You've eaten them into a deficit. Yeah. How many prawns did you eat? And this is a major supermarket <laughs> as well. This is, this is no small fry. Oh, so. so eventually they gave me the gold. They called my mum. <laughs> no, they knew my mum. So they called poor old Rachie and she said, Natalia said, look, Rach." It's just not working out. He's been eating all the prawns. He's been spraying customers. And they'd actually reviewed the CCTV. And I'm told, oh. rumor has it, legend has it, that they still have those CCTV footages of me eating all the prawns and throwing things at customers, saved away in a oh. file, and they go back and look, watch it every from every now and then. So you, you build morale. There's potential <laughs> that we could get that CCTV we, footage. We will, in another segment, bring that back. So you are now the morale booster of a Coles out there in... Where was it? Mooney Ponds. That's you. Area. I can't Mate. believe. Yeah. Got, now, c- congratulations. That's a good for the first yellow flag. Yeah. We've reviewed the play. That's massive. Yeah. And there was a definitely a foul on the play. So that was a foul. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, cool. All right, let's move on, mate. Because yeah. uh, enough about me. Let's talk about how the players have been going during lockdown. Now, they, 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 I think that most people will be handling it pretty well. We're obviously all over socials and everything, but there has been a few untoward incidents, a few DUIs. That's to be expected. Uh, we don't want to harp on that too much, but you have found something interesting that we do want to harp on. Yes. So the most important thing is the DUI All Star Twenty Two lineup. Now, uh, this has been chucked up by Useless Footy Stats and we love their work. So we're going to read out the uh, the best 22 team who have been uh, done drinking under the influence. <laughs> so from the back line, we have... Drinking under the influence, you reckon? Driving <laughs> under the influence. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I, I, I see the D and I think drinking. <laughs> you see the D. I see, <laughs> I see the D. Just read the team out, Ponji. So from the back line, Danny Jacobs, Royce Vardy, Chad Morrison... Halfback flank is Byron Pickett, Luke Hodge, and Sharad Wellingham. In the centres, we've got David Wirrapunda. We've got Dane Swan and David King. Forward line, Jared Harbrow. Jay Schultz at centre-half forward, Liam Jarrah. And then Jeffy Garlett forward pocket, Brad Ottens full forward, and Jordan Degoe in the other pocket. And on the ball, so we've got Michael Gardner in the ruck, Lockie Hunter and Chad Fletcher both on the ball. And on the interchanges, Kane Turner, Dawson Simpson... Tyson Stengel and Ronnie Burns. So, now, yeah, captaincy. We're giving it to Hodgie. Yeah, you have to. Uh, Norm Smith medalist. I think the only one on the field. Was Swan a Norm Smith medalist? I'm not too sure. Mm, I can't really remember. But uh, yeah, so Hodgie's captain. He's yep. going to really sort of rein the boys in and they, and just be a good leader for them all. Yeah. And then, best on ground, absolutely without a shadow of a doubt, has to go to Liam Jarrah. He has blown the casket. <laughs> now, if we're talking stats. He has doubled any other player on the field. He's blown a 0.260. Unheard of. Unheard of. He's blown up the breath machine. 0.26. And I, I'm, I'm saying that potentially going into the to the twos next week will be Swanee because he's blown a 0.054. He could have nearly drove, drove away from the scene. And for a bloke who spends his pre-seasons in Vegas, to come back home after that and blow a 0.054... Yeah, we're, and expect we're, to be staying in the starting lineup every week. I just, I'm just not buying yeah. it. So we'll be chucking him in the Scooby Doo's. And uh, another honourable mention is David Warraponda. Zero point one five four. So he's given it a good nudge. He's had a solid game. That was our DUI 
All Stars. That was our DUI All Stars, and we love that. So well done to Footy Stats. That's that's uh that's hilarious. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk a bit about the draft age. Yes. So, so I'm going to kick that to you and give us a little bit of your thoughts on the draft age. Yeah. So there's been a bit of <coughs> um, talk. Just First of all, actually, Ooh. I would like to just say that you went through the Vic Metro system and the the whole draft camp system and everything. So this is. Co- it is it relevant. It, yeah, it is relevant. I've I've been through the under eighteen program and you know the road to getting drafted. So I understand the importance of a draft year and the eighteen year old year. And I've been through wanting to try and get drafted at the age of eighteen. So I guess I'm drawing through all those experiences um, right now because the the competition isn't going ahead because everything's kind of missing in lockdown. Um, you know they're thinking it's an opportune moment to bring the draft age to nineteen years old. Or older to give more life experience to people coming through so uh, Luke Beveridge is one of the coaches who's pushing that from the Western Bulldogs and so is Dimmer and then another quote that I touch on is that um, Sam Walsh who was a prolific player in his first year um, he's come in and dominated and I think was the fourth uh, best player for Carlton uh, in their best and fairest he's come in and uh, and yeah dominated from his first season so you can look at it that way and look at players that can come in and make an impact straight away yeah. Um, and so for me, I think that um, keeping the draft age at 18... So is you're saying the evidence is there that players are making an impact in their first year? Yeah, players are there, they're making an impact. And I think also going through my experience of um, then finishing, doing a 19-year-old year uh, after I finished school, I wasn't very productive. Needless to say, I'm probably the least productive out of a lot of people. <laughs> so we won't put everyone in that basket, but... I really found I was a bit lost after school. I didn't have structure. I didn't want to work because I just wanted to do footy. And that was a pretty difficult year. So right. I, I kind of find that the structure is actually very good. And then they get straight into things. Boys could get lost, um, go down different paths and not end up you know, reaching their goals. So we could okay. miss out on some players. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point. But for me, I would actually argue the opposite. And I think that the two key arguments are life experience and BCE. Um, you're a prime example of this, Richie. You could have gotten a 99. You could have been an astronaut by now, but instead you got a state secret. <laughs> I, the state secret for people who don't know what that is, it's when your VCA is 30 or below. Now, I, I, did, I did give it a crack. My, uh, well, I, I didn't actually give it a crack. Let's be honest. I gave footy a crack, but my studies, I, I did four subjects. They fell to the wayside. Yeah. I, I didn't really uh, put too much effort in there. Right. And when it came to reading out the results uh, on that glorious day when I got my ATAR, we opened up the sheet of paper. It has your four um, electives. And uh, I was a bit confused because I was wondering where my ATAR was. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, because you have a score for each subject, I, I thought, okay, oh, you just add them up. So I got a 70... <laughs> Four subjects. It means you're averaging seventeen point five. Yeah, just for uh, just for a raw score out of fifty. <laughs> I thought I got a seventy. I quickly realised that my score wasn't on there. Oh dear. Dad, so, Dad didn't know what was going on either. We were a bit. Uh, I was. Uh, I was a bit worried how he was going to react, but he was good about it. Oh God. So yeah, that, that's 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 the argument for me is that I think blokes need to have that time to focus on their VCE as well because so many guys are going to really gun for footy and not get picked up, and then they're going to have you know like wasted the opportunity to get a good score in VCE and to sort of open up other doors in life so I think that's that argument I think it's easier for a guy like Sam Walsh to say who was just tailor-made for football he was actually named by his cohort as Mr. Perfect so that's the kind of person he is so he's definitely a better uh, caliber of human than I am (laughs) (laughs) so yeah that's the and then obviously the life experience going to schoolies and doing all of those things that you want to do as as a an 18 year old guy so mm. i would argue that it's it's more reasonable to raise the draft age but i do see definitely yeah. from both perspe- perspectives absolutely and then we've got another opinion about it mine and your opinion and then we've got goza the goz right so if you want to hit him up with the uh, the quote as to why yeah. the draft age would be important so so goza we all obviously know he's a very funny man and he reckons quote let me be the example of why the minimum minimum draft age should be 20. The Suns just guessed that because I played five good games, was tall and had potential, I was going to be a superstar. I knew I was going to be terrible. Give recruiters two extra years so that they don't draft Gorringers. 
<laughs> That's a Ruben quote by the big boy, and he is a very uh, comical man. So that is another uh, example of why the child yeah. age could get lifted. I don't I'm, know. Glad, I'm glad he's with me, the big guy. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So it's the moment in the show that everyone's been waiting for. We're going to be talking about Best on and Ponchi, mate. He's been working his little white backside off. <laughs> To be getting this segment up and going. And everyone's been wondering since the start of the show, what is this best on business? So, Ponchi, give it to us, mate. I'm wrapped. <laughs> what we've got is best on segment is just your local league's not here at the moment. And neither is AFL. So, we want to bring that vibe back to you. We want <laughs> the best sprays, best pep-ups, coaches just going off their rocker. We just want the best footage. So, we've got an example for you after this. Um, but after the show, please send in any similar stuff. Any coaches in the Scooby-Doo's going off their head. Absolutely. We absolutely love it from local league. Two's coaches losing their voice. Anything that is local footy. Uh, every week, we're going to be giving a shout out to whoever gives us the goods. We're going to be saying what club it is, who gave it to us. And somebody's going to be winning their choice of a hot dog or a pie and a can of soft drink after the game. <laughs> the old right? Someone's got shot. best on. <laughs> Guys, at Hello Game Day, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we're all over the board. So slide into our DMs, hit us up, G- uh, email us even. We have email, we can use it. Uh, Hello Game Day Podcast at gmail.com. So get around it, guys. So without further ado. Without further ado, let's uh, let's give the first pep up for the first coach spray. Absolutely. And his name is uh, Steve, Shane, Shane Lennon. Lennon. <laughs> Shane Lennon. <laughs> Shane Lennon, the great man. His nickname is Sparks, apparently. We got this out of the... Uh, <laughs> the comments in the YouTube video. And it must be Sparks because he's an absolute live wire. Yeah, he gets up and about. He's an inspirational man. So guys, check it out. If you if you don't feel like running through a brick wall after this, then I don't you know. You never will. <laughs> <laughs> Together, everyone achieves more. There's no I in team. What can I do to make this team better? What can I do to make this team better? What can I do to help us achieve something special? The fairy tale. The fairy tale creating history. In it together. We've got the good job, boys. We go out and we get to do it together as a group. A tight knit group. Will, boys, will. The will's got to be better than the skill. The will's got to be better than the skill. When it's your turn to go, you go like there's no tomorrow. Win the ball. The most important thing. Win the ball, win the contest. Make a decision. First options are always your best. Execute. <laughs> Take the game on. Have courage, have confidence, and your own ability, and your teammates are blind. Self belief, trust. If it is to be, it's up to me. Come on. If it is to be, it's up to me. Lessons are learned. Trophies are earned. Come on. Oh, how good is that? Local footy sprays, pop up speeches. We love it all. The razzle dazzle. So, guys, seriously, if you've got anything good to share with us, you know where to find us. Slide into our DM, send us an email. We love it all. So, best on. It's Ponchy's segment. It's his little baby. I love it. <laughs> but now, moving on. This is the bit that everyone's been waiting for. We've got Tuki Miller. We've done an awesome interview with him. And just for a bit of background for everybody, I've known Tuke since I was about six or seven years old. We played juniors together at the mighty Marby Lions. <laughs> Under 16s, I got the call up for Interleague. And we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk <laughs> you, love, you love pumping it up as well, so he'll keep telling you about it. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to know Tuke through high school. We went to high school together. He's one of my best mates. I moved up to the Gold Coast and spent a bit of time with him up there. And I just think it's exciting to see a bit of insight of what, is he, what he's like as a, a person. Yeah. So. yeah, And and we know how much you love you love your Tuki boy. Yeah, right? I love him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it really comes out in the interview as well. And I think that's one of the really special parts of this. Um, one of the other really special parts is his family. He's had such an amazing life. Uh, his parents in, the, in their own right are both incredible people. And we're going to touch on that as well. And then also, Tuki... Is you know we, we see on the foot in the footy field this like really serious, really, really professional, the argy bargy with Dane Zorko and all that. But outside of that, he's just a great bloke. You could not hope to meet a better bloke, and we're just looking forward to showing everybody that. 
and you know portraying that on 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 screen i think that really shines through in the interview as well so yeah absolutely so i'm looking forward to just yeah delving into that character and seeing what he's like behind scenes with a couple of mates so hope you guys enjoy yeah All right, Ponchi, it's half time and we're going okay, but we could still lift another notch. I can't believe we're going to be interviewing Took Miller from the Gold Coast Suns. I'm nervous, Moosey. <laughs> Snap out of it, Ponch. We know this opposition like the back of our hands. You've got to back us in. All right, Moosey, I'm backing us in. Phew. All right, guys, Ponchi's backing us in and now you've got to back us in as well. All you need to do is go to our website at www.hallogameday.co and click subscribe to join our mailing list and to receive weekly updates on the podcast. All right, you ready, Ponchy? I'm ready, Moosey. All right, we are here with Tuki Miller in our first ever interview for the uh, first episode of Hello Game Day. So give him a bit of a pump up, Ponchy. Yep, so I'm going to start off with the, uh, the usual intro I'm hoping to give. <laughs> So we've got the Gold Coast Suns vice captain, fastest Suns player to reach 100 games, father of two miniature dash hounds, Alfred and Walker. <laughs> if he's not out in the surf with Mick Fanning, he's singing an 82 at his local golf course. The poster boy for Suns uh, on your, in your second year of the club, or better known as that random bloke printed on the side of the G-Link tram on the Gold Coast. And most <laughs> the owner of a perfectly groomed Afro back in the day, Took Miller, welcome to the show and give us your best hello game day. G'day, guys. Hello, game day. Well, I think we're going to start off the show hot and we're going to give you a bit of rapid fire. So it's just answer if it's true or false or we might delve into a bit more just to get things going. So the first question I'm going to ask you, is it true that the uh, AFL commentators consistently pronounce your name wrong during broadcast? True. Very true. And, and would you like to just get that right so people know how to actually say your name? Well, I don't know how many times um, people like see it spelled, but it's took, not took. Clear as day. <laughs> Completely took. Yeah. One of, the most, hard. one of the most recent ones was even in the pre-season. You're still copping took after about five years. So, for everyone <laughs> at home and commentators, it's took. Yeah, I actually told a mate the other day that we were interviewing you and I was like, yeah, we've got Took Miller as our first guest. And then he replied with, oh, yeah, so how is Took? I was like, man, I just yeah. told you his name. Soldier. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're glad we cleared that one off the cuff. Uh, next one. Is it true that you've adopted your ghetto booty from your father? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I reckon I might have. <laughs> yeah, it's juicy. Cool. Dad, Dad's got that American booty. <laughs> <laughs> Big Wiley, and we'll get to him. The next question is, is it true that the only crunches you've seen Stewie Jew perform in the gym is when he crunches puff pastries? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so true. Don't know if I can answer yep. it. <laughs> well, the money so far. The knowledge is good. All right. Is it true that you were kicked out of a nightclub because you were talking to the wall that you were that drunk? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say uh, true. Also very recent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> recent trip in, oh, uh, no. in Worcester, and that was uh, that was a pretty funny one. We didn't remember the night, and <laughs> yeah. the, once we got told uh, what happened, uh, yeah, we were beside ourselves with that one. Uh, next, one. There's, oh, there's a mystery because there's still a mystery of someone pissed out the window, and it wasn't me. <laughs> someone what? pissed out the window on the second story, and it wasn't <laughs> me. <laughs> So there was a big stitch up in the house. What happened? Like, so what happened that night? It was the first night in Whistler. Took's come to visit, and we. I only remember being at the bar at the start, and because we were excited to see each other, Tuki was getting shots after shots, <laughs> and I've been pacing myself on beers for the last six months, so yeah. I'm not doing shots. Anyways, we've come home and there's been an issue that someone's pissed out of the second floor <laughs> window, made a snow cone from and, the second floor, and I was. <laughs> adamant that it wasn't me but the evidence does point to the fact that it probably was me in the end the other one i actually wanted to bring up was that uh we we completely forgot what happened that night but you are uh, walking around the house trying to figure out where the bathroom was and you walked into the same girl's room on the third occasion she was finally like bro wrong room get out and you just stand there knees and then you say bless you and then just walk off Oh, mate, I couldn't tell. I, it was the first night I'd been there. and I, I reckon I'd been there two hours, not even. I didn't know where we were sleeping. Oh, wow, that was, that was a disaster. It was funny. That was so, funny. 
Uh, it was a, that was an absolute classic. Uh, the next song we've got is we've come across a photo that you've uh, you've put up with Christian Petrarca in the under twelve Vic Metro, and we'll put it on screen for you. <laughs> now there was a bit of talk with um, with Geordie Degawi and Pendles that if he got fifty thousand likes, uh, he would dye his hair platinum. But we wouldn't. We want to know how many likes would it take for you to bring back the fro permanently. <laughs> Jeez, that's big. I don't even have 50, no fifty thousand people, let alone get that many likes. You'd have to get poor. You'd have to get five thousand plus. For, if we got five thousand, you'd attempt to bring, bring back back the fro. I'll, I'll attempt to bring back the fro. You give me no. five thousand, I'll attempt to bring back the fro. All right. Well, we've heard it here first. We get the photo up that on that. Is the... massive. If if we could get five thousand. <laughs> To get bring back the fro, Tookie. You you said it here. Yeah. This, this is actually going to make bootlegs because I thought for sure you would have said fifty thousand or something really high because it's a that's a long process. It's not just a bit of peroxide in the hair. So here so, it is. Here's the photo of <laughs> you and truck, and you are adorable <laughs> in that. Absolutely beyond adorable. So that's what we're looking to bring yeah. back. Um, and it would be the biggest thing for the fro since Guy Sebastian in the uh, since the two thousand uh, Idol. <laughs> So we're making oh, the comeback wow. for the pro. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, another, uh, is it true? Now, is it true the day you realized you were going to become an AFL player was when you were 17 years old and attempting to sneak into the birdcage at Flemington Racecourse and a man, uh, a managing to escape four security office, officers with some razzle-dazzle footwork after uh, being busted with a scratched ID? <laughs> oh, <laughs> look. I reckon, I reckon the detail of that story is too complex for it to be false. So, <laughs> yeah, I really doubt it. Like, true. Let's be honest. <laughs> Can you just talk Can us through that? Elaborate on the, yeah, the, the razzle-dazzle on the, on the uh, Flemington race course. No, nah, yeah. I remember this. So we, we were, um, where were we? We were like down in the, we come out of the birdcage, I think. Or we were downstairs in like the normal section. I can't yeah, remember just, what section it was. Just near the train station. Anyway, we're getting, yeah. we're copping a bit of a, we're copping a bit of a chase. Let's be honest. It wasn't great. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, so anyway, we're, we're running out of, um, trying to get out of Flemington and like these security guards run towards me and, um, I decided that I don't know why, but I thought I was Jared Harbrow or something like that. And this guy was running at me and I gave him a little goose step and I completely wrong footed him and he went <laughs> left, I ankles. went right. I broke his ankle like I legit broke his ankles <laughs> in a full suit as suit shoes and I got up the stairs and I got made a getaway. I high tailed it. I don't reckon I've actually run that fast in my lifetime. Just Mate. But I got out of there so quick. Mate, and that's not your only uh, running with security guards either. I've I've gotten a story off Big Ruben Fulton Greek, who was your best mate as a kid. <laughs> about you, him, and Reese Muir at, uh, I think, Melbourne Central one day. I think you used to get bubble cups and uh, spit them down from the top floor <laughs> and you got chased around <laughs> and you got caught in a toilet for 20 minutes. And apparently, rumour has it that Reese Muir was so scared, he was literally shit scared. He had to take a shit in the toilet. <laughs> 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 Can confirm. I oh, do remember can't that. Confirm. We, we got stuck. Yeah, can confirm. That's oh, very true. And that was uh, ages ago. That was funny. <laughs> the last um. Sorry. Uh, the, the the last bit of uh the rapid fire segment. Now, this is probably the most important questions that we've been building up to. So, with Queensland footy, um, and we want to get on the notion of bad blood. So, I can imagine you know where we're going with this. Uh, we want to just ask, how real is the bad blood between you and Dane Zorko? Because we've actually come across a photo of you in a couple of off-seasons ago at uh, Ryan Lester's wedding. And you guys... <laughs> we'll pop it up on screen. <laughs> you guys are actually in the same crew's party together. So is there, is there actually a bit of bad blood or are you just trying to pump up the Q-clash? <laughs> oh, mate. Anything to get viewers and a few likes, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, oh. it, it was a, a bit of a joke, a, a doctored uh, a photo. But the only way that I can actually explain or I can feel that is legitimate that we found in a woman's weekly magazine, we found this photo. The only real uh, description of your relationship with Dane Zorka that I think would actually make most sense is that if he was actually your father. So can you please explain <laughs> this photo? 
<laughs> Please explain to you. Is he your father? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I no, we're still talking about ghetto booty from my father. Oh, that's not, if that was my father, my ghetto booty didn't come from there. <laughs> oh god, no! We're, we're, we're using that as a bit of a segue to actually talking about your great man, uh, Wiley, your father. So can. You please give us a bit of a description of the uh, the great man for us. Uh, yeah, so my dad's um, he's African American from Toledo, Ohio. Um, he's a very charismatic bloke, as you both would know, um, and he's a muso, so he plays bass. He's a singer. Um, you know, he's been working on cruise ships until you know what's gone down recently, but that's a long story. Um, but yeah, he loves it. He's um, he obviously really out there bloke. Um, you know, I've had a really good relationship with him since I, since I was young. Um, and, yeah, he's loved football. You should hear some of the stories about him coming to my football games. He kind of knows what's going on, but kind of doesn't. Um, I, uh, he calls, I'll possibly give a running uh, commentary because this is the one yeah. you don't get the opportunity to, uh, to see is when he gets to watch you playing a game, you don't actually get to experience it. Now, I've experienced when you're in your under-18s playing for Calder Cannons, and I'll, I'll try and be as, as enthusiastic as he is, but basically to set the scene, the commentary is the ball's coming from the flank, it's getting kicked into the square, you're one out, and you're going to kick a goal. That is how the natural commentary would be. But when Wiley explains it and he's sitting there commentating the game, it's coming in, he's like, ooh, ooh, get in the butts, get in the butts, get the six. Get the six. <laughs> he absolutely gets up and about. So um, another one about Wiley is when I was out front of the G one day, I think it was a Richmond game. And I saw him busking because he busks out front of the G. Some people actually might, a lot of people who go to the footy regularly would have seen Wiley. He's an amazing musician. And um, I was watching him for a little bit. And then in between his songs, I said, hey, Wiley. And he didn't recognize me. Probably the seventh or eighth time I've met him, at least. <laughs> Never recognized <laughs> him. <laughs> I'm flat about That'd it. Right. But I said to him, hey, um, yeah, I'm Jake. I'm Took's son. We've been mates since we were six. <laughs> and, he, and he goes, you know my son. <laughs> You know my son. He gets so ex- <laughs> he gets so up and about. You'll never see a man he who does. cried more than if you say you know his son. <laughs> yeah, he's a proud man. Very proud man. He does love it. <laughs> he does love it. And absolutely, mate. And another one is your mother, of course, is another phenomenal human being. Absolutely. We love Ruthie and she is probably a better athlete than you. Give us a bit of a rundown about <laughs> Ruthie. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a fair comment. She absolutely is. Um, yeah, like you said, mum's obviously an amazing woman. She, um, like, I grew up with her pretty much my whole life. Um, she just recently finished her twentieth marathon. Uh, she only started running, I don't know, maybe twenty odd years ago, and wasn't much of an athlete when she was super young. And then um, ever since she had me, she, yeah, just took this, just took this road of running, and she um, got to complete her twentieth marathon and in Melbourne last year, um, which was really cool. And I, stupidly enough, decided to do a half and end up in the medical centre afterwards. But <laughs> that's, another, another, that's another story. But, that's okay. um, yeah, she, she's um, obviously super incredible. She, you know, she's... And she's come from the as well. Yeah, no, nah, she has. She has. She, it's just a passion. Like, I find it weird that a passion could be long running, but, you know, <laughs> each to their own. But she, um, yeah, besides that, she, you know, she's got a degree in psychology and uh, she's doing a master's in marketing. Um, you know, she, she's someone Richie would know, both to know. She just keeps herself busy. Yeah, um, and she's phenomenal. obviously super caring and, yeah, yeah, really empathetic. So, yeah. Uh, very lucky to have someone like that in my family. She gets, she gets the most out of every minute of her day. I've never seen someone be so <laughs> productive. Like from 5 a.m. How's this for a story? About she'll nine. Be, she'll be like, I remember at the Colder Cannons games under 18, she'd be at quarter time breaks, half time breaks. She'd have the laptop popped open doing study to make sure she was going to get this stuff done. Oh, Because what does she um, do? The, um, what, what's it like the extreme uh, fast paced course? What, how do you, what do you call that? So, oh, yeah, yeah. It's the, um, like the, I know the ones you're talking about. It's like a, like you're it's doing intensive a courses. Yeah. Intensive so courses. Yeah. Intensive yeah, courses. Yeah. Yeah. 36 month course in like 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So it's, mate, yeah. her whole life, she's just, yeah, she's productive as anyone I've ever met. And yeah. As I said, mate, I've known you since we were, we were very young. We played juniors together from the age of seven. I think we were playing under yeah, 10s at Maribyrnong Park yeah. together, like when you had the famous... Yep, yep. <laughs> we'll put a photo up on screen. I'm wearing a helmet, so that's He's, why I'm, I'm reluctant. Yeah. He didn't want to bring it in. He's wearing headgear. 
Yeah, it's a bit cowardly on Ruth's behalf. I won't oh. rush you too much. Keep going, big boy. Tukey had his own headgear with the afros. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we've been we've been playing juniors uh, since we were young, Tukey boy, and uh, we both both grew up in Ascot Vale. Now Ascot Vale has produced some elite talent, and particularly the parade where you grew up. You got yourself. Big Racing Muir, who, who, who was shit scared. <laughs> we don't, we don't. <laughs> then Tash Sultana as well, another good friend of, of both of ours who grew up on the parade as well. Yeah, yeah, she did actually. So, um, it's funny, it's like a claim to same, I reckon, for me. And you'd probably be the same. I always say like, oh, when she pops up, I'm like, oh yeah, I used to jam with her. I remember I used to play the drums and I was like five and six. And she, they, like we used to play. We used to actually like play together a few times. She'd come to my joint because I had... Um, I had a drum kit and um, yeah, we we try and jam together. I was absolutely useless. I was so useless, <laughs> but she was obviously pretty epic. So yeah, that's kind of a cool little friendship we've had yeah. um, in the past, which is sick. And um, yeah, mate, we are you sure you would have been there for a few jams at my place as well when she'd get my mum's twelve string out and freaking <laughs> go nuts? <laughs> yeah, massive, abs- absolutely a claim to fame. Um, another question we obviously want to bring up is. Not only were you a gun at footy with your, your junior years, it was actually also a passion for cricket. So if you want to kind of delve into a bit of that. Yeah, um, and I was pretty lucky when I growing up. I uh, played a bit of baseball early on when I was real young, between like 8 and 11. And then I picked up cricket, junior cricket at Footscray United. And um, yeah, I kind, of, I kind of got bored in the field. So I decided I want to be the keeper. And ever since I made that decision, like it really took off for me. Got to play, represent my state um, in the under 15s as a as a wicket keeper, which is really cool. Um, and got to play first grade cricket for North Melbourne, um, which was a really great opportunity. Um, my first game, I played against Chris Rogers. Um, for anyone who's like would know cricket, um, so I played quite a few games for Australia. Um, he made a century against us and got out reverse sweeping our opening bowler. But, you know, defeat the person, it was still pretty cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, won a premiership at St. Kevin's with playing cricket as well, which was, which was unreal. So um, I don't think cricket was probably going to be something I was going to go all the way in. Um, as I, I just love footy too much. But, um, yeah, I had massive opportunities in that, in that space. Um, and I played with quite a few players who... And try to go all the way, like Guy Walker, Matt Short, um, Sammy Harper, um, quite a few young folks who are still trying to make their way in the cricketing world. So yeah, yeah, it was a pretty cool experience. And just on just on that, Tukey, we also played our under sixteens together, and we had a superstar lineup. We had me, you, <laughs> Guy Walker, Joel Smith, who plays for the D's now. I was clunking them at full. I don't know if you remember round one. I kicked five against Oak Park. I was clunking them all day. Tell me on the car. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you weren't clunking them. Clunking you didn't them. come out of the square. <laughs> you give us the rendition of how he actually was in the forward line. He was no. He didn't come out of the square. He played really like <laughs> just low key. Probably worked from like the goal line to the top of the top of the square. Yeah, it's true. He stayed out the back because he's. Real stay at home. Like well, real stay I don't know. Home. Obviously, they needed to stay at home forward in Interleague because I got the call up to go to Interleague training. I went to two trainings then. Oh, oh my, my God. Um, <laughs> next on the agenda, we want to touch on the, uh, the homelessness youth program that you and uh, big saucy two-meter Peter have uh, got brewing up there on the Gold Coast and just give us a bit of indication on how that all came about. Yeah, so we, when we were in our second year, um, Pete and I went to the community um, in admin stuff and we honestly, we had more time on our hands that we wanted to utilise and we thought what best way to do it than try and, you know, spread our wings and go out into the community. Um, and we, the club already had an affiliation with the youth homelessness and um, essentially there's about three different shelters and their progression homes um, and... Yeah, we, we started off just off our own bat. Um, we had the kids come to the stadium. Well, at the time, it was just a portable shed, and the, yeah. and um, which is a lot different to what it is now. But um, and we just had them over. We cooked for them. Um, you know, we made sure they you know could use the gym facilities if they wanted to. Um, we could sit down and just have a chat to them if they wanted to. Um, and yeah, um, five years later, we're we're still doing that. Um, you know, they've, they've progressed into the main stadium now, which is really cool. Um, obviously, a bit more to show off, but 
um, yeah, I mean, it's more just an opportunity. It was never about uh, media coverage or, um, you know, about what we're doing to the outside world. It was more about us just helping, you know, younger kids find their feet and being someone they can listen to or, you know, being professional athletes. They always want to talk to you and, um, you know, know what we did in our day-to-day lives um, and aspire to that. So, yeah, it, it's been really cool. Um, you know, pretty blessed that we're still given the opportunity to do so do that um so yeah it, it was really really is fun that's awesome that's awesome mate you must get some awesome perspective from that as well yeah definitely um you know some of the stories you get i mean you sit there and you go how lucky am i to be in a position where i'm doing my dream job and um you know my training is is considered work um get to run out in the field with you know 30 odd thousand people and um, you know, do what I love and get paid for it. So, um, you know, and then, you know, you do talk to these kids and some of them, you know, have, have found their feet and some of them haven't. And, you know, they're still struggling to, you know, find a way to go to school or get a job. And, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it is very privileged to be in the position we're in. Um, but, yeah, obviously we can help them as well. So it's pretty cool. Awesome, mate. And the last question for the day. So we haven't gone too hard on you. Um, I want to touch on some travel, but I actually want to touch on what you do in the off season with your training camp at Santa Cruz and just give a bit of insight to people with stuff you do outside of um, the main season and how you actually better yourself and take yourself to another level. Because I reckon that'd be pretty interesting for people who wouldn't know what you did training wise in the off season. Yeah. So um, obviously uh, people probably would have seen uh, a few years back, even uh, two years ago, Travis spoke, there was a footage that came out on the AFL website um, and some of the work that he was doing. So I went to the same facility that he did. Um, and essentially, I, I just wanted to do something different outside of just the norm of, you know, your off-season program. So I was lucky enough to get an opportunity and the hookup to go over there and, and spend time um, about a week at this facility. And to be fair, like the, the facilities weren't crash hot. They weren't like, um, you know, really expensive or have all the gear. It was more about um, what I was there for and what I learned was just um, how to use my body um, in certain ways to get the most out of it. Um, and that's without, um, you know, punching heaps of heavy weights or um, it was more about, you know, how can I use my diaphragm um, and breathing and how I can... Um, you know, find some deficiencies in um, my left side where I had had an ankle reconstruction quite a few years ago and I was still having problems with a lot of my left side. I had no idea that was the case. So how I could better that um, on a day-to-day basis. Um, yeah, and to be fair, one of the main things I got out of it was how to look after and, um, you know, how to, you know, recognise what, what's going on with my body whilst I'm training. Um, and it's amazing how much of a difference that makes. Um, you'd be surprised how many athletes, in, especially in the AFL world and quite younger ones that don't actually know their body yet and how to, you know, how to adapt to an AFL lifestyle and um, how to look after themselves both mentally and physically. So, um, yeah, I got hates out of it uh, when I was over there. It was a really cool experience. Yeah, mate, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's just, it's interesting when you hear that and, um, yeah, you, you just assume, you know, you go through your programs, through your 18s, you get into the AFL, you understand your body, but, um, mate, credit to you for doing that stuff. And we'll also put, we'll, we'll repost the footage you post on your Instagram onto our page so people can flick through and just see the little snippet because it's interesting just the different dynamics of weights and levers and, I, and stuff. I'd also recommend anyone getting on and following you as well because you have got some pretty interesting stuff in there. So get around Big Tookie Boy on Instagram. I think it's just Took Miller, am I right? Yeah, mate. No one else has my name. I think it's Took Miller. <laughs> <laughs> don't say it yeah. into Siri. Yeah, Took. Yeah, don't say it into Siri. You won't get it. So Beautiful, mate. Well, we'll get, we're going to leave you to it, big fella. I'm sure you've got lots of stuff to be doing in isolation. I'm sure you and Big Two Meter have got some meals to cook or something. We know how much you love cooking. So uh, Thank you so much, brother. We really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I hope uh, everyone got a lot out of this. I right, really appreciate it, Tookie boy. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. I hope it goes well. Right, Cheers, right. mate. Take care, Tuki. So that was it. That was our interview with uh, Big Tuki Miller. Absolutely love that. And uh, here we are for the third half. We've called this bit the third half, which I like. <laughs> yep. Uh, really thankful for Took to, uh, to <laughs> come in. Well, to be on Zoom with us. Uh, it was just good to get a bit of insight. And we really hope that people kind of take away a bit of a uh, personal flavor and actually get to know the bloke that he is because he is a good bloke. 
believe it or not. <laughs> and um, he's not the choir boy that a lot of people would think he is. I guess he's not really got the choir boy because he, he does give Dane Zorka yeah, a bit of a rough up. Yeah, and there is a bit of a rough and tumble. And yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's, it was just it was just good to kind of get a bit of insight on the great man. And we really appreciate his time. Yeah, so thank you very much, Tukey boy. Um, just once again, guys, we're, we're all over the internet. We're going viral, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plugging. Yeah, yeah, we are on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We're even on TikTok, for God's sakes. Check out our TikTok, because we've been, we've been playing around with yeah, it. We'll, we'll brew it up, and hopefully we get some content. So we'll see how we go on the old TikToks as well. We're trying to really yeah. just branch out to every media kind of outlet. So. Exactly, and we're prolific as well. We're going to be posting <laughs> plenty of stuff. Yeah. So get around us at Hello Game Day. We are also on Spotify. We are on Apple Podcasts. Castbox, all the good ones. Every week. <laughs> As opposed to the bad ones. If you're a major podcasting platform, we're on you. Yes. <laughs> so we are everywhere, all up in your grills. Yep, exactly. At Hello Game Day, get around us. I've been the moose. I've been the ponch. And next time you decide to listen to our podcast, bring a mate. <laughs> <laughs>